<laughs> you just transitioned from spreading the babies and now you're watching their kids. There That's right. <laughs> <laughs>
job. <clears throat> Our next presenters uh, asked um, Ryan and Josh from Punk to Punk and share with you some of the 3D software that we saw <coughs> in school boards. Um, and then uh, just talk a little bit about today. And, uh, one of the things I want to share with you is today, they, they've been, these guys have been troopers, they've been here all day, and they worked with students starting around 11.30 this morning. Uh, we had this set up in the cafeteria. So I came down about 20 after 12, and there was a line of kids waiting to get access to the, the, the uh, 3D glasses. And so uh, Ryan and Josh, I don't know if you want to kind of walk through uh, the space. Do you want to find a guinea pig to, to uh, sign up? I know Amy was dying to try that system back out again. I vote for Fred. <laughs> You want to try it out, Fred? I stumble a lot. <laughs> it's not cool, Fred. It's pretty easy to do. Do something virtual. Go ahead, Fred. Chris, would you just grab the lights so we can see yeah, the screen a little better, please? And thank you. Let's see. Does anybody want to put the headset on? Come on. It's pretty cool. Come on, Jeff. This is right up your alley. Sure. Okay. You can do it all from your chair. All right. I can do a lot. I know. <laughs> Oh, oh, I got this. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> so there we go. Go ahead. So there's the headset component, and then we can either do an Xbox remote, so you kind of use the joysticks. Uh -huh. um, the other ones are two independents, but the uh -huh. Xbox ones. Yeah, I can probably use the one. Xbox controller. Yeah, so everything that Josh sees to the goggles we'll see on the screen behind him. Okay. And then he'll yeah, be able good. to... Of course, I'm going to you into the middle of nowhere, so you can't really... No, that's tough. Right. It's focused on anything. Yeah, While they're setting Josh up, I want to just give you an update. We had our first community fitness forum. It's going to rotate you around. Oh, yeah. So now you're at least looking we at something. Yeah, I'm going to have the information center here. All right, so I'm going to hand it to the remote. Show them what the existing diagram is. This was the initial design, which is the first one. We had a few conversations about the equipment. We had members of our community. I can walk around. So I can go like this. I can be a voyeur and like, what? That's weird. Yeah, whenever you get up to like a table. It'll force you to kind of go up the room. Yeah, and so if you go to your left. left. Josh is in the foyer right doors. now. This is the foyer where you walk in. Sorry foyer, if I'm making you sick. <laughs> and then if you go through those doors, yeah. they'll get and you to this stuff. All right, all right. So if you go to your right, it'll yeah, be I the see. classroom or straight in front of you. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. So right now you can see kind of the design. We've got storage as well as flexible furniture in the space. And you can see how the, the garage doors open up to connect all of the rooms together. And so Josh is looking through right now from the maker space, uh, or from the inside the classroom out to the maker space. Okay. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. I lost my, uh, I'm up on the desk now. There we go. Uh, where do you want me to go? There's another room here right now, Josh. Can you spin around where the red chairs are? Yeah. There you go. Oh, uh, yeah. So that's the classroom side. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Pretty cool. All right. Anything else you guys want to see? Could you go back to the fitness center, Josh? We were talking. I don't think you actually saw it. Oh, I saw it now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. I lost uh, Else now? No, they're looking, those shark looking out for the parking lot. 
Oh, okay. well, I'll get back here. This is iron for the community area on the other side of those drinking fountains, those green chairs are. Okay. Those are windows that, that are in the corridor, middle of the corridor. Okay, right. I gotta get these off and we'll okay. come. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank oh, you. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I guess it's a little funky now. Yeah. <laughs> so the other thing I wanted to update you on the board is that uh, we had our bid opening last week, last Thursday for the capital outlay project. Uh, regardless of say the bids came <coughs> substantially higher than what we wanted. And so we have agreed we're going to go out and rebid the work to be done. So Mike is working with Chris and Aaron and I to kind of address some of those, those things that came back to us that we need to address. Mike, is there anything you want to add or comment on that? No, yeah, I think you basically said it. It came in a, a lot higher than what we anticipated. Um, I think some of it was just taking advantage of the circumstance. Um, and I think some of it was uh, wishful thinking on trying to get everything that we were talking about in a small project like that. So we have to look at some of, some of the things that have inflated the price. Um, and, we, and we've done that. And uh, I think we have a good approach. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back out to bid tomorrow. I'm going to repackage it. Um, we're going to make most of the alternates. Kind of do it like an a la carte when we get the bids in. Kind of see what each um, part costs. And kind of pick it from there so that we know we're going to be able to do the work. Um, we'll open that on, I believe, January 10th. And we'll look to have, have it in front of you guys on your 14th board meeting. And then we'll look to do that library work in February, February break. Right. Josh, do you want to highlight the outdoor space here? Because that's something that we didn't get a chance to look at while Josh was uh, right around there. So, let me get out of. This is looking from the courtyard. So the one piece, you guys added towards the end, but was the outdoor gazebo space and then a potential white screen so that way you can present either videos or if you're doing like an outdoor presentation. And then to the left of where he is right there will be a parking lot. Yep. That's going to be one of the new parking lots that's um, all on the gravel right now. This one? Wall. No. Oh, these? Yeah. Are they like two, two and a half? Yeah, that's 27 inches. Mm -hmm. It'd be similar to like the seats right here. Right. Yep. Um, but the <coughs> area between the library and the, and the new part of the I mean, if you want to just go there through the building real quick, right yeah. so everybody kind of sees all the spaces and look up, you know, kind of just do it a little bit yeah, easier. Yeah. Jump back where we started. <coughs> I will say a couple things that you, you may want to just have a conversation about amongst yourselves is some of the signage that we're going to put on there. If it's going to, I mean, we put innovation center and stuff like that, but you may want to go another route or something mm -hmm. like that. that so. We have lots of time. We have a about that. We have a retreat. And we all kind of like the Chelsea Dale and the Yeah, okay. So this vestibule right here is a secured vestibule, so that way for your fitness center as you open it up in the evenings, the people will be able to come in but not be able to get into the school. So in the vestibule, they have their own entrance into the fitness. And on the right to the restroom, too. Uh, this one? Yeah. yeah. So they can change. Oh, right. there. Is there a shower there or just a... Just a sink or a toilet. Yeah. Really good. Close that. We, we had a lot of discussion around that, Josh. Yeah. We, designed, we decided against it because we didn't think people would be utilizing enough to make sure that it was worth the space. You're probably right. Yeah. That, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I know you guys are still working out the arrangement of the equipment, but mm -hmm. and then you had a. Now that 
store would go into the non secure, right? Right. Hallway, yep. Block. And then you had a seating area in the back that overlooks the stem space or the entrance to the stem space. Mm -hmm. Showing that light well, uh, skylight. So they're going to start with some of this over the over the brake with some of the steel for that. So the 26 is the, the crane is going to be starting to swing steel oh. on the campus. So over the brake, the building, the campus for the most, the building is closed to, to anyone other than the right 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 Yeah, and then we'll have some practices in here. The third, the second, third. So here we have the, we're in the corridor, walking down towards the theme space, got some display space on the left, got a large window that will look into the theme area. <clears throat> this was that seating area that was inside the fitness. So this was your maker space. Um, it connects in the back corner, connects you to the art room. And then this is an overhead door, so that way you can have an outdoor space, indoor space. And it also connects you to the other three teaching spaces. So when the students enter the space, they're going to enter and walk through the maker space to get to the new technology classroom as well as the other two steam spaces. So the conversation we've started to have are, are who's going to be responsible for these spaces? And, and right now, preliminarily, we're talking to Chris Gear and Leslie Simpson that they're going to really oversee to make sure these spaces are spacing not only maintained as far as all of the equipment and supplies that they're going to want people to want to expect to come when they come into the steam space, as well as the scheduling. The rooms also have an overhead door component along with a regular door component. There's no office. Okay, that's what I like about you. No, there's no. Yeah. We're going to put that in this room. He sets up the building. This is the technology room. Brian, did we decide on, on like actual equipment? Did we talk about like stuff, table kind of stuff, or is there going to be stationary equipment like that? Or? <laughs> <laughs> We're working on that. Though. I'm just curious what they're actually doing. So, just, and I, I, I laugh because Chris and Mark Lippin, Chris Gear, uh, Jeff Lippin uh, have been having extensive negotiations, as you can imagine. Right? Uh, right now, the budget is unlimited, and this is what we want and desire. So, oh, sure. tomorrow they have round three or four, I believe, of dialogues about what equipment they need to present to Aaron and I preliminarily gotcha. before break. Uh -huh. And then after break, the plan is that they'll more than likely have to meet with us to need to tweak some of the things that they presented. And I have them on, on schedule to present to you at the board retreat in January as what the equipment is going to look like in that space so that you can give feedback as well. Okay. A good question. There's a lot of uh, different lenses that are looking at the spaces through different responsibilities. And so we're going to try to marry all of those together the best that for everybody. Each room has storage casework, but they also have display casework, which is above it. Now, was there a drawer that separated that space from the other? Yep. Oh, okay. So right here is a folding partition. Oh, cool. So all 
three of these, the wood shop that I was just in, this space and then the STEM classroom are all divided by a folding partition. Mm -hmm. So it can either be all open at once or everything can be broken down into four spaces. classroom portion. I think that provide, I know it provided with me a great opportunity to, just to experience it. And then you get we had a lot of good good conversations, Chris, Chris, Jeff and I about all right, what do we want to actually put in the space and make sure that it's multi purpose and responsible. seem to enjoy it and the few staff that played with it too really got into it as well. I know we had uh, some of our, our custodial staff, cafeteria staff, I came down, I know um, we, our bus driver and we had um, Dave Fleming and Crystal came over and they, they put it on and we're trying it so it was great for, to get a wide variety of people to see it and, uh, and I, again I know for me when I did this I was really got excited to see this kind of closer to reality. Anything else, Michael, that I forgot that we to touch on? No. Well, uh, like I said, I'll be here the next time I'm here. It'll be the 14th for Capital Outlay and then the 29th for the solar. Okay. That's the other piece of the 29th. We're going to have an update on the solar project with you know, updated numbers. We're going to invite uh, Secretary Ripley and Secretary Bill and Jones for that conversation as well. So I just want to say thank you again. Sure. Uh, have a great holiday. Merry Christmas to you guys. Uh, drive safe back tonight. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate it. More about them in the office. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, um, I was to go. I was to go. I to go. I to go. I was I am going to share some numbers with you tonight. <laughs> You may or may not know our uh, current commissioner has her background in special education. She's a huge advocate for students with special needs. One of the first things that she did was um, require that all boards of education be presented with special education data at least once per year, either through a face-to-face or a written report. So this is this is part of some numbers. Um, it is 2018, 19, but it will get you thinking about 2019-2020 as we run through the presentation. Um, at any time, feel free to stop me. I'll take some questions. So one of the things we look at is the least restrictive environment. The amount of time our students are spending in general education. The goal is always the largest percent of students um, spending as much time in general education as possible, knowing that when we put our information into clear tracks, it's not just students taking, some students have special class ELA or special class math outside of general education. It's also counseling, speech and language, occupational therapy, physical therapy, anytime that they are in a separate setting for whatever service counts as outside of general education. So some of our students are about 77, 78 percent, but they didn't count in the first number. So the first thing we look at is we compare 
how what percent of our population are spending 80 percent or more of their time in general education the numbers are roughly similar from 2016 to now we had a smaller percentage in 2016-17 that were 40 to 79 percent in general education that number has grown significantly some of the numbers have pulled down but some of the numbers have actually pulled up and those students with less than 40 percent tend to be our students who spend most of their time uh, a large portion of their time in self-contained classrooms the solar points for clear tracks any questions on this So, one of the things we want to look at is our out-of-district placement. We've made huge efforts here at Genesee Valley to have as many of our students as possible in the district. So way back in January, I have to predict for Dr. Schmidt, what do I think it's going to look like? So way back last January, this is what we were looking at possibly two students attending Elm Street Academy, which is an alternative high school. Generally, it's, and that's open to any students at all, general education, special education, that might be struggling. Um, they have related services such as counseling and resource room. That's about all the special education services they offer. A student in an 811 middle school, three students in the 611 intensive high school setting, a student possibly in a 1211 middle school, and another attending a 1211 CDOS job coach. Um, and again, 811 is eight students, one teacher, one aide. When you get to smaller ratios of less students to staff, the greater the needs. So that's, that's one way to look at it. So we drew into September. And our two students at Elm Street shifted into a more restrictive setting. So the green went away, and now we're here at the blue. And so I kind of highlighted on yours. Mm -hmm. You want me to go back, Fred? No. Who determines if they go from Elm Street to the 819? The Committee on Special Education has to convene. Here? Here. Right there. No, here. Here. Very often, um, They'll be struggling. Lots of communication between myself, Sarah Donnellan, and Chris McNell, who's the principal of Elm Street. <laughs> that need went away. The committee convened. Because remember, I'm predicting in January. Sometimes we don't convene on some of these students till later. Did not need that. The need went away there. We had student H, and students J and K. So you can see how my numbers, our numbers, almost tripled from last year. We had three, four, we added one a little bit later, four and out of district placements, three that were actually here in the building that we weren't transporting. So now we are actually transporting to Sayo, Wellsville, Elm Street Academy, only in middle school and only in high school. And those are this year's tuitions. These tuitions do not include counseling, they need speech and language, if they need related services such as OTPT. This is all inclusive. It includes counseling and uh, homeschool liaison and a social worker. This is the most restrictive setting that we can get to outside of a residential placement on the continuum of services and special education. Any questions? How many of these classrooms, Carol, are in GV, housed here? Um, just this one, but we only have two students here, and the other two are trans being transported. So only, okay. there's 
the space. Spaces, there, are, there, are no, there is no room for students, Cataraugus Allegheny, in these settings. Um, Randolph Academy High School is also full. Tried to find placement recently for a student. There's just simply, especially at the high school level, no. Carol's not alone. We met with uh, Senator Young and Senator Mendoza on Friday. This was a topic of conversation. Yeah. Mental health needs of our region, as well as the lack of placement opportunities for students uh, who, have, who, who, in essence, take on the most unique and most support. So, it's one of the things we were asking them to continue to push our funding for. We get additional beds open in this region, we get additional supports in this region, because we're seeing uh, more and more um, needier kids come to school, and uh, there are resources, frankly, are just not. Understand we have everybody here that we can from our own district. Yes. Now, how come the state doesn't put pressure on the BOCES to open such a room for the other schools that, like Randolph and everybody else, that's going through? So what, what, we have you know? we have expanded. The BOCES program has expanded significantly as far as the number of classrooms, but BOCES has to make their projections typically in May. So if not earlier, we have we have by May first we have to commit to whatever the services we're going to. Purchase from BOCES for the following year. That's what we, we have our the BOCES board vote that approves their budget on a regular basis. And so, likewise, when we have a number of students who move into the area with their additional needs, and then as we go through the hierarchy of interventions to determine is this is this the best placement, and then if it's not, we need to go to a more restrictive environment and a more restrictive environment. So typically, it gets to October, November, December. Their classrooms are maxed out, and we're saying, well. What are we going to do for these kids who they've already budgeted for? And so, as Carol can touch on, that's part of the issue that we faced this year. It was our turn when it came to the number of students who moved into the district. I'll show you that in a minute. You'll see um, frequently across the, the CSC chairperson listserv, and I just had one come through today um, looking for a placement for a student in a 1213 room, which students in a 1213 room are significantly developmentally delayed. Um, multiple disabilities, there's no room um, anywhere. But the, the chairs will reach out and go, does anybody have a place open for this student? Um, does anyone have their own room open for a student with these needs? And so it, it is a significant need and there's a shortage across all of the regions. So in addition to the students that we have out of placement, we also host students from other districts not through BOCES who attend GV classes, pay tuition to help to fill some of our own special education courses. And we're meeting on January 14th with the Allegheny County superintendents here to talk about not only what opportunity, what are their projections for special education needs next year, as well as what are some of the opportunities for sharing resources, whether like professional development or athletics. So just so you're aware, that's, those are conversations that start in January, but again, if, if we have an influx in October of a family that moves in with significant needs, then you know, we've, we've planned. And a lot of times there's not a lot of space for extra, for extra space to take place. What of the job coach? I guess I understand the other one. But... The students in the, in the 1211 CDOS job coach, they are actually out in the field working four days a week and are, are in academics one day. And we are not able to, we have students that go out right now in um, our 1211 life skills plan. They have internships at Topps Market. They go twice a month. They are now doing site visits all over Allegheny County. They've been to Angelica Spring. They've been to Wellsville Library to see what sort of um, supervised work opportunities might be available for them. I know we're talking about expanding that next year. Lauren Skull's um, careers class does internships right now. I know we're having conversations about expanding those possibilities. So, but I can't, when students go onto a job site, there has to be a job coach, a certain person with that job coach certification um, working under a work-based learning coordinator. We're very lucky in this district to have two certified work-based learning coordinators, but the job coach also has to be trained and has to stay on site the whole time overseeing the students. Um, and for this particular student, they outgrew us.
classroom aids because we have a lot wanting uh, to understand when we keep our kids in because a lot of the kids that we keep in a lot of other districts send out so we have eight full-time equivalent aids and I say FTE because two of our aids are split between uh, the pool and classrooms they serve PK3, PK4, kindergarten, library, and the pool. One of those aides literally just gives breaks to all of the other aides because our aides are required to have a 15 minute in the morning, a 15 minute in the afternoon, and a 30 minute lunch. That was mind blowing to try and figure out how to do it because you can't leave three year old, you know, you gotta have two people in there with three. So, um, in our special education, we have 17 full-time equivalents, including five one-to-one -one aides. We have one health, um, a health care plan implementation support. We have six that serve special class sections. Those are self-contained. And then we have five aid-supported classrooms. An aid-supported classroom is a room where perhaps a student has, is, is significantly distracted, distractible. We're trying to work with the student to teach them how to self-monitor their own attending. They're on a token reinforcement system, but the teacher needs support implementing that self-monitoring plan with the goal being in ultimate independence. So there's an aid in there so that either the teacher's working with the student or the aide's working with the student, but not a one-to-one -one aid. It's considered to be an aid-supported classroom because whatever the needs of that child are for it, having an extra person in the room to provide that level of support. As far as having a two one one, we, are, are we have some one, we have one to one aids. Um, and right now, those those aids are primarily at like the K one two level. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of um, Brandy's class. Uh, Brandy's class is a six one one autism room. I have we have let that, and that'll be one of the classes. Um, you know, last year Brandy said, okay, I'm ready, take a couple more. Um, but no, we have to be careful because we, we can't compete. So um, if somebody asks, I offer. But if there's also age restrictions, 36 months on those rooms. So if somebody has a first grader who needs a 611 room, I, I can't help them because it's very much outside of the age range difference. But to answer your question, we have two students, a teacher, an aide, and we have not Registered behavior. Registered behavior, thank you. Technician. Technician as well. So, mm -hmm. but they are they are also uh, the neediest of our students, and so they require the most attention. Uh, and so that's you really you balance you know the least restrictive environment to the most restrictive environment, and there's stages in between that we look at. And that's what the, that's one of the things that the committee has to look at. They look at not only how well they're functioning in, in a least less restrictive environment. If there's issues that come up, what are some of the, the supports and interventions they need to put in place to help that student be more successful, whether it's an actual classroom change or if, or is it just different types of interventions with the teacher interacting with the student to try to help improve their behavior and improve their life. So it's not automatically just let's throw an aid to support this kid. There's no. a lot of steps that the community can I understand that, but you know, I, I guess my question is, you know, when it, when it comes down to it, and there's, there's two of them in there and there's a unique kid, does the state obviously mandate that do they help us out at all yeah. as far as the funding wise yeah we have what's called high cost aid impact aid that impacts the when we have so one part of carol's job is she has students called stack children so any two of them that are high cost students that are above i believe the threshold is thirty five thousand uh, dollars i think we're up to thirty eight thousand yeah. dollars to educate we can carol applies for additional funding on a per student basis so yeah. go ahead i literally have to figure out a cost ratio per student by um, by IEP, how many hours, how, uh, how many sessions of OT, how many sessions of PT, how many sessions of speech and language, how many hours of um, behavior consult, um, <coughs> making sure everything is on the IEP, and and then coming up with a per student cost um, for all of our students, because all of our students with one to one aids, all of our high cost, high need students that are receiving multiple services, um, and then 
entering them into the SAC system, which generates the aid back to the district. That's how to spend your Christmas, if anybody wants to know. <laughs> that's, on my, that's, on my, that's on for, for holiday break, because I needed to be quiet when I'm doing all that math. <laughs> I just want to make sure that all is working. Yes. Um, and one of the things, too, that um, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, that, that Dr. Schmidt and Erin and I talk about when we look at our students is you have to look, and other districts have the same conversation, at cost effectiveness. So when we look at bringing the students back, you have to look and say, is it, I mean, is it cost effective to do that? How, how can we serve them better here? and also be um, responsible with district resources. And so we, we had that yeah, conversation with our more questions. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to it, are, are they benefiting from GV? Oh yeah. Or are they, I guess. I guess yes. that's the question if we send them out, you know, I, I hate, I hate saving. Sending a student out of district is the last step for us. For us. Yeah. And I, I agree with you, but on yeah. the other hand, we have to look, you know, on the long run of, in, in the end result, are we getting what we're pay, paying for? And we do, and, and and there are times the kids go out, they come back in. There, I mean, I can, we we have a list we could go through of yeah. the, the, the the program changes and the interventions that have taken place. One of the things Carol's going to be presenting to you is part of our plan for next year, and that's just an exi a prime example of what we're talking about. So, go ahead. I didn't do a slide for that, but I can talk about well, it. Talk about <laughs> so that? anyway, just just to give you an idea, if I've looked a little frazzled lately. Last year, on Wednesday, which is the first Wednesday of October, um, our school age count, that's six through 21, of students with disabilities was 70. We had 70 students with IEPs. Um, and there's our counts by classification, seven with autism, two emotional disturbance, 33 learning disabled, which tends to be the most common, that and other health impairment, which is 14. Those are students with attention deficit, um, oppositional defiant disorder, uh, some different things that impact learning in the classroom, a hearing impairment, speech and language, and multiple disabilities. So, Bed Stay 2018, uh, we had 74 students, eight with autism, three with emotional disturbance, traumatic brain injury. So these were students that either moved into district or were classified after Bed Stay last year. So I'm going to give you some real-time numbers. My real-time count, because these students were not included, out-of-state transfers and new referrals. They had their meetings held after October 3rd. My actual real-time number is 81. So I went from 70 last October to 81. Of those, 10 moved in to the district. Significant needs. Um, our out of state transfers, when a student, the process is when a student comes in with an out of state IEP, regulation states that we must honor the IEP and provide comparable services. But then those students become new referrals to the Committee on Special Education because then we need to evaluate them and make sure they still qualify under New York State regulations, which is why we didn't convene until after October 3rd. Poor Bethany had to have time to complete for about five. In students who transferred in from out of state. I'm up to nine students with autism, five with emotional disturbance, 35 learning disabled, two intellectual disability, one student with hearing impairment, 12 speech and language. Those tend to be our little guys in the primary, K1. 14 other health impaired, two multiple disabilities, and one with traumatic brain injury. And I have five new referrals to the committee that are still pending. So when I look at where I'm going to be in June, I fully believe I'm easily going to be at 90 students. That's, a, that's, a, that's an increase of 20 students over, yes. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a lot. Um, there's a couple different reasons we've had students move in. We've made some changes to our RTI process that are, are beneficial. The referrals are coming and they, I, I believe they are valid and warranted referrals um, for students who, who may very well qualify for services that have not made gains at the tier three level. So 
when I work with Dr. Schmidt and I work with the teachers and we talk about the needs for next year, one of the things we look at are all those little guys with the one to one aids. Do we open up a 12 one one plus one primary room to meet their needs, to bring them all together because they are within that 36 month age range? What is the ease and benefit of providing those services? One of the messages, um, and I'm gonna just put backwards. Oh, no, I'm not. Mel Bricker used to tell me. <coughs> Respected greatly, was a Ken Elagosi special education administrator for years. He used to say to me, Carol, when you districts have half of your kids in one section, you really need to think about taking them back. And so, some of the conversations we've had here, this is a room. Well, if you look at a hard, a hard number, you have two hundred and sixteen thousand dollars of tuition that we're paying Lagosi's for students to be. Educated. So our conversation now we can we can can we provide the same level of service, if not improved service, here on campus and bring and hire in essence a teacher or do we have a staff member in house that can do this? Uh, so those are the type of conversations we're having right now. One of the other things I wanted to talk about was um, we have been struggling with our response to intervention uh, since I got here and before I got here, is to how do we best make sure that kids are getting the supports. Most importantly, answering the question of what do we do when a student is not learning? How do we gain additional support for that kid to make sure they are? And Paula has taken uh, and demonstrated great leadership on that this year, working with Carol. Uh, and so one of the challenges, or the unintended or intended consequences that come from a better response <coughs> system and intervention system is additional referrals for students who need support. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it, it, that's not a bad thing, it's a good thing because we're providing hopefully earlier intervention, which is mm -hmm. gonna have a more positive impact on kids learning uh, later as they go forward. But um, it's one of those unintended or intended consequences that because she's doing such a good job working with teachers and you know, Brian and Sarah are having the conversations with the, the teachers around the scheduling of interventions and how we're working with interventions. And you know, Brian just led, led a group of his teachers to uh, make a recommendation to change mid-year based upon some what they feel is gonna be a better practice for kids. And so that's the type of responsiveness here our leadership team has demonstrated, which I really appreciate. Um, we don't we don't take hiring staff lightly. We certainly don't take sending students outside of our district lightly. No. You know, our practice has been uh, owning our own kids, and we want to continue to do that. But there will be times where we'll want to make a recommendation to you to say, under these circumstances, we feel that it is best for this student to be outside of Genesee Valley. But that is a last resort as far as I'm concerned. And the, the teachers will tell you that I am very direct in session. Um, I ask them questions beforehand and I really push them to reflect on is this because the role of the chair is to bring the committee to consensus. If the chair cannot bring the, the committee to consensus, it's then the role of the chair to make the decision. And so I have to make sure when we are moving to a more restrictive placement for a child that it really is in that child's best interest to make it clear to the parent that it should not be, a, I don't want to say lifetime sentence, but a sentence for all of their academics that the goal is always for those students to come back. So a referral comes from a teacher, Mr. Ed and yourself. I mean, a, a teacher doesn't just say, well, you know, this kid is just too much. I want to refer without some kind of backup. But there, there has to be some backup. Now parents are, can ask for a referral to the committee. Mm -hmm. um, they can write a letter and ask for a referral. In regulation, um, it says I have 10 calendar days to respond to that request and I always start by having the parent come in and speak to the building principal about their concerns. Nine times out of 10, the parent will withdraw the letter and let us work through the RTI process. A lot of times parents just think they want them tested and, and so we work through the RTI process. The, any referral that is coming in via the RTI process, those students have received all of the intervention in general education that, that we're able to provide. And I'm not showing enough growth to 
close that skill gap and get where they need to be. And so that is what the, the basis of that is. Principals can also refer if they feel a student. Mm -hmm. What else do we do with the student? It's typically, well, that's behavior. Or they work with the teacher, they coach the teacher on instructional strategies that may quickly run out of instructional strategies and they're not working to help the student be on time. Yeah. Before we get really technical, there's lots and lots of conversations. Oh, that's why I want to add on. You know, I got confidence that our teachers work hard. I just didn't want to be the only one from the room talking to teachers and saying, hey, yeah, we're doing more. They send it off for referral and then who's gone or whatever. Like, what's going on? No, because then, then what happens is, is I come back and say, if I say, where is, the, where is the documentation? Where, where, where is the documentation? Where, so for instance, if the committee is looking at a student who um, is struggling in gen ed, and I'll say, okay, where's it? You can't just come to me and say, we want an, an 811 placement. Where is, because that's a behavior placement. Where is all of that, that data? Where are the referrals? Where are the discipline logs? Where are your anecdotal records? Where's all the documentation to bring to the committee to show, because that's a hard conversation to have with parents too. Oh, yeah. And the expectation parents, is there's parent dialogue there from the teacher to the parent. And, 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 and yes, and there is, and, and parents cry, it's, it's hard for them, you know? And I always tell the teachers, um, I always tell the committee and I tell the parents that, and I explain to them, especially first time through, if we can't come to consensus, it's the role of the chair. And I tell parents when the, when I, when I move and make a decision that the teachers don't support, they leap and grumble about me. When I make a decision the parents don't support, they do have something called procedural safeguards, which is a huge document that protects all the rights. Okay, so the parents, parents have some steps they can take with the teachers. <laughs> So the, but goal with, good. the goal with Carol's presentation tonight was just to bring additional awareness. Yeah. You've heard us anecdotally say people are, especially when numbers are up. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. And, and what you've got a taste of is the conversations we've been having since October around staffing and, and for next year and the classrooms that we're going to have to build for next year. These conversations are going to impact the budget. And so as we start to prepare for the next conference of the budget, I want you to be aware that this is going to be a level of dialogue that's going on. One of the things we noted at the elementary when we had the conversation the numbers are growing and the needs are greater than we've seen. That, that the kids, the, the needs of the students are greater than we've seen in the past. Um, so when we looked at integrated code plot sections, the, the students really need a higher level of service in terms of modified curriculum. So numbers are growing, needs are getting greater. I just have one more question. No, sure, sure, absolutely. absolutely. Under, under real time count. Uh, yeah. Like the learning disabled, we have 35. Does, does, does a kid like with the dyslexia or something be considered in that it count? Depends. It depends. Simply having a condition does not qualify one for an IEP. Okay. What has to happen is whatever is occurring has to impact at a significant level that student's ability to be successful within the general education curriculum. So, for instance, we have students with autism who have no IEP and no 504 plan because they don't need they don't need that. And then we have the students that we talked about that require tons of services. So it really depends on the level of impact. One of the greatest celebrations we have at committee is when we turn to a parent and say, "We're real sorry, your child no longer qualifies for special education services." Which doesn't mean that they still don't need some support via 504 plan. Um, or some academic intervention services, but the goal is to embed strategies so that students can be successful without those special education supports, if it's within their power. Okay. Okay. Carol, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, no persons to address the board. Uh, I need a motion and a second to approve. The coordinate of education minute for the November 26th mm -hmm. meeting as submitted. I vote. Josh? Second. Amy? Any questions on the November 26th minutes? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Approved. Okay.
Opposed? Motion carries. Administrator's reports are in your packet and on the table. Business office district treasurer's report by Ms. Lowestrand. She had to leave, but I did hear Brian ask her if there was anything to report on. She said no. So things are good. Yeah. Is there a question you have that I can try to answer? I'm late to school. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I need a motion and a second to approve the treasurer's report. Go ahead. Second. Brett? Any questions on the treasurer's report? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I need to have a motion and a second to amend the motion from the November 26th board meeting, moving the extracurricular activity account dated 10 1 through 10 13 of 18 to 8 1 through 8 31 of 18. Um, Amy? Sorry. Thanks, Jeff. Questions on that? Just a typo. No. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Need a motion and a second for the warrant reports. Fred? Second? Josh? Questions on the warrants? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Consent agenda? the consent agenda I need a motion and a second I do have one if you look at your addendum there is one uh, addendum there to approve Nicole or up the form to run the shot clock for the remainder of the home basketball games for both boys and girls along with those that are listed one through five Any questions on that? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I'll say I'm counting the poll. Okay. Otherwise, I'm supposed to vote Four, yay. Any nay? And Fred abstains. Personal action items accept the resignation of Bill Horton as girls' JV basketball coach effective November 28th due to the lack of players. Josh, did I see your hand? Yes, sir. Second? Second. Amy? Any questions on that? I think we were all filled in last night. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, accept the resignation of Dan Anger as the senior class advisor effective November 26th. Motion, Bud. Second. Fred. Questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Appoint Senior Class Advisor uh, to replace Dan Anger of Tracy George as a recommendation of the superintendent. Um, Josh? Yes, I'll move. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I have to That's what I was thought, probably. Opposed? One abstention from Fred. Four, yay, no nay, one abstention. I accept the resignation of Don Greena due to retirement, effective July 31st, 2019. So moved. Bud? Fred? I got two nods back there. Questions on your resignation? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Except the re resignation of Denise Klein also due to retirement effective June 30th of 2019. Amy? Bud? 
questions and demeans. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Motion carries. Appoint long-term substitute Spanish teacher Robin Alf Alfeser. 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 Um, you can see her credentials there and it was in your packet. Should start on or about February 15th, 2019 through June 18th, 2019. Josh and Fred. Any questions on Rob? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Create one full time teacher date position uh, for full time teacher date position effective December 18th, 2019. <laughs> so you were planning on it? Well, it's, he's been doing a long-term sub. So oh, gotcha. Any other questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Appoint full-time teacher to aid for the position. Uh, appoint Carla Lund, who's been working on a part-time basis or sub-basis, effective December 18th, 2018. Fred. Questions on Carla's appointment? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Dr. Schmidt, information and discussion. On the 14th of January is our next regular Board of Education meeting. The 28th is a work session, which is quickly filling up. So we'll have that work session here. I want to make sure you're aware of that. You received information on the Capitol Conference in Albany. I didn't share that information. A lot of you didn't go. I was just yeah. informing you of when the date is, and if, if some of you chose to go, we would need to move a board meeting because we have one on the 11th. So, so far, no one has responded to me. It's really anything exciting there, about going. Okay. Anything that it does not break my heart, but I wanted to make sure you were uh, all on the same page there. So, yeah. good. Um, I have three other things before we, we go into the executive session. Um, I wanted to remind you and make sure I send an invitation to you that this Thursday uh, I'm hosting our annual staff holiday celebration at the Belvedere at 3.30. Uh, you are welcome to come and join us for some food and uh, refreshments. Please do if you're available uh, at the Belvedere. And then um, I wanted to share with you that uh, we have opened a Genesee Valley branch of the Boa Credit, uh, Federal Credit Union here on campus. And that will be starting, or has started, I believe. Last week of January. Thank you, sorry, last week of January. They'll be taking place in the main office conference room. Correct my hours, 11 to 12? 12 to 1. 12 to 1. So um, we'll have students who are working with a representative from the credit union to actually open for an hour for student thank, student thanking or staff thanking or anything they want. And anyone from the community, they can ring during that time and, and utilize that. Staff by Alcoa. It's overseen by Alcoa. Step by our step by our students. Mm -hmm. yep. Are they going to be doing that shift? Yeah. Um, so it'll be a bridge to work over the summer and then the office will be in the school side of the position. No, but the, it's hopefully the, the summer position. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Any students can apply to this? Or? Uh, yeah, we selected a couple uh, FALA seniors this mm -hmm. year to kind of try it yeah, out. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, just let the students be able to open the same yeah, account and, yeah. and, and they can bank right here. I think their transaction uh, maximum is $300. Mm -hmm. So you know, if they have more than $300, they got to go to a branch. But, mm -hmm. uh, but per transaction, it's more than $300. And then the kids with the experience actually are getting to tell her and learn what we are doing. Where, um, Mr. Chain will help us out with a, 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 new, a new desk to serve. And we thought that the main office conference room would be the most secure location. Mm -hmm. and it's out, out front, yeah, right? Right, yeah. right up front. Yeah. So they come in and then for an hour every Friday, we'll be out front. Or 
to be in the ring. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we do do job responsibilities for Tori. So I just want to make sure you were aware that that was happening. The last thing I want to share with you is that I had a a very informative conversation, an encouraging conversation, with Jeff Stevens today. Jeff is the dean at the uh, Alfred State Wells Fargo campus Mm -hmm. about the possibility of us creating a contractor pathway, uh, career pathway, Mm -hmm. uh, in partner with Alfred State. And so the conversation was uh, talking about us partnering to allow college level credits for students who may be interested in the contracting path. And so we are going to be getting together in January uh, with a group from GB to talk about what are some of those pathways we want to look at, what are the existing courses that may qualify for some college credits, and then um, what are some unions we should reach out to so we can develop uh, partnerships for, uh, and hopefully that the, the experience they have with GB would count towards some of the time that they would be able to shorten with their journeyman or their yeah. apprenticeship hours. And then um, we also are having a conversation about possible development of the Genesee Valley Foundation. Um, again, I told you before, my goal would be for us to be able to purchase cheaply or need the renovation of homes in our community, to renovate those homes and then to sell them back to the community in an improved state. Uh, that would be a great real world learning opportunity for our kids, as well as improving uh, both of our communities. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about how that may be possible. And in order to do that, we need to, to form the Genesee Valley Foundation, and that would kind of umbrella over our conversations around other important groups in that area. So I just wanted to share that a very preliminary conversation, but uh, certainly moving forward on those pathways that we talked about, um, the career pathways for teaching as well as uh, the contracting and the trades. So that's all I have. Is there anything I'm, you're looking at me like I'm missing something. Am I missing something? Just <laughs> Thank you. 